Hi everyone, today we're gonna to be responding to a video uh, by Dr. Gregor, um, one of the, I think he's still one of the most popular vegan influencers, not 100% sure of that, um, but let's see what he has to say. Heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. So that sentence he has on the screen is super interesting, right? What was changing in the 1920s? It was really about the, or even in the decades leading up to the 1920s, it was really about the industrialization of food, right? You had the invention of, well, cottonseed oil had been invented some years earlier, but, or had been used for uh, industrial purposes for years earlier, but around the late 1800s, it comes into the food supply in the US, right? And at one point, I think the year is 1901 or 1902, the US is not allowed to export lard to Canada or Europe because it's all tainted with cottonseed oil. So you have this vast explosion of industrial seed oils in early 19 aughts, late 1890s. And then 20 years later, you have a, a massive spike in heart disease. What does that tell you? And 20 years before that, by the way, in the 1860s and 70s, there is no heart disease. Meat consumption was higher in the 19th century than in the 20th century. So if people are saying this is because people were eating meat, like that doesn't bear out with the with the data. United States and has been our number one killer every single year for more than a century. Dr. William Clifford Roberts published extensively on the cause. Of so I, do we care about whether someone publishes extensively or do we care about whether they have sensible things to say? Is this going to be a long appeal to authority fallacy, this video? Pop killer. He was the chief of pathology at the National Institutes of Health for 30 years. This is more like, we don't care about his accolades. We care about what he had to say and whether there was any sense to it, right? Head up Baylor University's Heart and Vascular Institute. He authored more than 1,300 scientific publications, wrote more than 100 book chapters in cardiology, and was the editor-in-chief of the American Journal. So again, why should anyone care about this? I mean, I can give you examples here. If you look at really discredited, for example, racial theory, it, it, what used to be called, oh, I forget the, the, the so-called, the cranial science where you like measure people's heads and try and derive IQs and stuff like this. You know, those scientists got a lot of accolades in the late 1800s, even in the early 1900s. But they were, they've been proven to be completely incorrect. Everything that they said is complete rubbish. So just telling me that someone got a lot of honors and that he got a lot of prestige and that he was the editor of a journal, you're telling me nothing about that person. They could have been, they could have believed the world is flat for all I know, right? They could have had no sense at all. Cardiology for 40 years. Well, what is the cause of atherosclerosis? Well, first of all, didn't he mean causes? I mean, there are lots of things that can increase the risk of heart disease. High blood. Yeah, so, so this is right. This sent, I, I don't know, I won't say it's right, but this is the accepted theory at the moment that cardiovascular disease is what they call multifactorial. And you need some combination of these things in order to develop cardiovascular disease. I, I disagree, but, um, well, I mean, I agree and disagree. Let's see if we get into it more. Blood pressure, diabetes, cigarette smoking, inactivity, obesity. But none of that matters, he said, unless we have high cholesterol. So that is completely wrong, right? So, so we can show data sets. Let me see if I can bring some up. We can show data sets showing that you get there are lots of people showing up to the hospital who have low cholesterol levels, for example. Now, this study was done in 2009. There's other studies. There's a study out of Sweden in 2023, which actually showed five years before it was a massive data set. If your cholesterol was low five years before you had a heart attack, five years earlier, you had a greater chance of having a heart attack than if your cholesterol was high, your LDL cholesterol was high, right? These are imprecise terms. We should be clear. We're talking about low density lipoprotein or any apple B containing lipo lipoprotein, which is LDLs, VLDLs, IDLs, and chylomicrons, right? That's the technical stuff, but your doctor is still going to refer to all this stuff as cholesterol um, in an enraging kind of way. So this is one set of, set of data you can look at. When, you, when people see the set of data, they're going to talk about reverse causation, that they showed up after they already had some trouble, and therefore the LDL was low. And that makes sense maybe if, it's, if the data is, I don't know, the day of the heart attack or even a month before the heart attack. But if the data is five years before the heart attack, as it is with that Swedish cohort, cohort, no, that doesn't make any sense, right? And there's this, right? Uh, this is a data set finding that high LDL cholesterol and statin use, interestingly enough, were independently associated with lower mortality. In other words, the people who had higher LDL were more likely to, to live, uh, to live to a longer age, right? We're looking at a fairly aged group, so between 50 and 70 and 70 plus. Atherosclerosis is a cholesterol problem. Yes, these other factors can... So it's not, right? Let's be very clear. It's definitely not based on what I've just showed you there. Um, also, what does it mean to say something's a cholesterol problem? Like this is very, very weird because you have cholesterol 
in the um, in the sort of lining uh, in the membrane of all cells, right? It's like saying cells uh, atherosclerosis is a cellular problem. Yeah, okay. I mean, everything is is related to cells in the human body. The human body is a, is a conglomeration of many, many cells, right? Um, so you're not telling us anything. There's cholesterol everywhere. So no, that doesn't make any sense. And amplify the cholesterol damage. But as long as cholesterol levels are low enough, heart disease remains rare. Well, this is this is a falsifiable statement, right? So there, this guy's using an appeal to authority. I mean, let's let's talk about another authority, one who I think um, has a has a better claim to authority. This is a fantastic paper. Um, one of the key author, one of the authors is um, Gerald Reven. Now, you want to talk about experts in the field of cardiovascular health and insulin resistance and metabolic me metabolism in general. Gerald Reven is the guy. He is he is very very you know all those guys accolades plus more. He has them. Okay. Now, what they do in this study and in several other studies that are similar to this, they divide people based into groups based on insulin resistance. Now, insulin resistance is a construct that we should define. What he did was um, he used insulin clamps. He was a master at using these insulin clamps. So what he would do, he would, um, he would clamp your body and he would see how much – he would try and keep the, um, the glucose the same, right? And he would see how much body your, your how much uh, insulin your body could uptake in a clamped state. And if your body could intake a, a lot of insulin, then that means you were insulin sensitive. If your body couldn't intake a lot of insulin, you're, it means that you were insulin resistant, right? Um, to keep the, the glucose in the same space. In other words, he kept trying to drive the glucose down. And in some cases, he drove the glucose down to levels that may not have been ethical at the time that wouldn't have been allowed today. Um, but in, in people who uh, were not very insulin sensitive, he found that you simply couldn't do that. Now. Um, now, what are the results? So he divides people into tertiles in this study. Some studies, it's quartiles. So you have people who are not insulin resistant. You have people who are sort of moderately insulin resistant and you have people who are very insulin resistant, right? Now, this is a high-risk population. I believe in this study, they already had a heart attack or they already had some, some disease, right? They're a high-risk population. So it's not a huge number of people, but you know that you're going to see events, right? I think there's um, 70 people in this study. Uh, N equals, uh, I don't have the, the number right in front of me, but it's not a high number of people, but you can see the number of events we're going here. So in the group that is extremely insulin sensitive, i.e. they don't have any insulin resistance, their clinical results, their, their clinical events is zero, right? In the case of people who are somewhat insulin resistant, right, moderately insulin resistant, you have some heart disease, some cancers, some heart attacks, right? Uh, in the case of people who are very insulin resistant, you have a lot of diagnoses, right? A lot of cancers, a lot of heart attacks, a lot of strokes, et cetera, et cetera. So, and by the way, this was all LDL. You can pl plot LDL here. LDL is not a relevant um, marker here, right? It's not, it doesn't correlate with much, right? Um, very, very irrelevant. Insulin sensitivity is an extremely relevant marker for all these things. So we have data sets that disprove what Dr. Greger just said. That said, let's go back to Dr. Greger. There's only one necessary risk factor for atherosclerosis, and that's elevated cholesterol in the blood. So we've just disproven that hypothesis, right, with a, a very clear data set where LDL was not correlated. High LDL was not correlated with worse outcomes. High blood sugar, <clears throat> high insulin resistance was very clearly. How low does our cholesterol have to be to prevent and arrest atherosclerotic plaques? Ideally, our bad cholesterol, the LDL, should be under 70 milligrams per decimal. So again, we have examples, including an example that I talked about in last week's video with Simon Hill, where his idea, his LDL is very low. I think it's very low. It's, it's not 70, but it's 100. It's around 100. And he is getting subclinical atherosclerosis at a very young age, right? So, and not just that, we can also look at the population level data in India, where people tend to have low to normal LDL and huge incidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, ASCVD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, right? So there's a lot of counterexamples for this. Whenever someone is presenting something, we have to ask a question. Is it their beliefs? In other words, is it a religion? Is it something that they they just like to say, right? Or is it something that they can back up by, sci in a, by using the scientific method? Now, the scientific method presumes falsifiability, right? And that's what I don't see with these ideologues. I don't see them articulating a hypothesis in a way that is falsifiable. 
Because if you did that, if you said, no, you need high LDL in order to have heart attacks, we have 100 million case studies that, that will show you, no, that's not the case, right? Lots of people get atherosclerosis, even with very low LDL. Later, which is less than 1.8 millimole per liter. If such a goal was created, the great scourge of the Western world would be essentially eliminated. This is, again, one guy's opinion. And it's, not, it's an opinion that is not borne out by the evidence. So we could put 100 million people on a lifetime of sufficient cholesterol-lowering drugs or be what he called a pure vegetarian fruit eater. So again, we have not just the example of the poor guy, what is his name, Mango Wozniak or something like that, who was a fruit eater since the 1990s and died with incredibly clogged arteries, according to his own partner's admission. Um, he died of a heart attack in his late 50s, early 60s, I want to say. He was not in good health, the poor guy, right? But we also have the example of pure vegetarian India, you know, a lot of people who are who I self-identify as pure vegetarians who only eat meat, even the non-vegetarians. I lived in India for many years. You're eating meat maybe once or twice a week, maybe if you're lucky. Most people are eating vegetarian diets, especially in North India. And they have some of the highest heart disease rates imaginable. You can see my interview with uh, an ER doctor from India, from Delhi. And he talks about how often he sees heart disease in the clinic from pure vegetarians. He's doing some data on that right now. It's off the scale. It's huge. It's beyond what we can imagine if you're not living in that society, right? So again, is this an ideological bias or is it a, a hypothesis? If it's a hypothesis, we should be able to articulate it in a way that is falsifiable. And if my if the data sets from India don't falsify it, then you have to tell me what what would falsify it because I can guarantee you such data sets already exist which is how we refer to those eating whole food, plant-based diets. Now, if we put everyone on drugs, millions would suffer side effects, such as developing diabetes. So, of course, a So that's super important to understand. One of the side effects of taking statins is that it leans you more into the insulin resistance pathways, right? In other words, it could make you worse, could make you weaker, could do all these other things, right? So, you know, I... I I don't really give advice on medications, um, but it's just something to be aware of. The way that statins work is as a kind of mitochondrial poison. And if you're using statins to control cholesterol, well, then why are you, right? It's not, it's not very logical there. A, the cholesterol, the LDL is not the issue. And B, um, there are, statins do have beneficial effects as well. They increase nitric oxide production. But there are other ways to get those benefits without the harms of being pushed towards a more diabetogenic pathway through the statins. Plant-based diet is the least expensive and safest means of achieving plaque-preventing LDL goal. So you, you, the safest thing, like that's pure ideology, right? Because again, to use the example of largely plant-based India, I mean, plant-based India, the the diseases of um, what are we calling them? The diseases of civilization, um, these diseases of affluence, right? The diabetes, sort of diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, heart disease. This is going through the roof right at the moment um so again you can't you can't just assume it's healthy you need a lot of data to prove to me that it's healthy or and and i don't even know what that would look like i don't even know how you would design those experiments given ethical concerns and so on and failing those experiments what we have is the default diet for humans which is an ancestrally appropriate human diet which is a hyper carnivorous human diet right there's a lot of data coming out right now about there's a study that's come out right now that hypothesizes that Neanderthals were eating not insane amounts of meat, as was previously thought, um, but maggots uh, that may have been growing in the meat. So this is a, a, a longer conversation that we can get into. But I, I will accept the premise that maggots may be part of an ancestrally appropriate diet, at least for the moment. Uh, we'll get into that maybe in future videos. Um, but whatever the ancestrally appropriate diet was, it was not a plant-based diet. We can de derive that. We can figure that out from the fossil record, from the nitrogen isotope analysis and so on. So that much is very clear. So if you're advising a plant-based diet, which is what this sentence seems to be saying, the burden of proof is on you. How do you know that that's safe? Because there's a lot of evidence indicating that it might not be safe. But few in the Western world are willing to live on the herbivore diet. Yeah, no, this shouldn't be, right? That means that, means that people have some common sense <laughs> because that is not the diet that humans evolved to eat. We don't feed lions salad, right? We don't feel, feed elephants cake or steaks or whatever, right? Every species has an ancestrally appropriate diet that actually to some extent for terrestrial animals, to some extent, almost everything is omnivorous. I've seen lions chewing on grass in the Kalahari or in the, Safari, in the Kruger National Park and so on. Very common to see that, right? So they're not pure meat eaters, if you want to think about it that way, but they derive most of their energy, most of their food 
in the form of the muscle meat of animals, right? Especially ruminants, that's what they eat. And if you look at the fossil record, that's probably what humans were supposed to eat too, right? Or were designed or evolved to eat, if you want to think about it in those terms. Because according to probably the most renowned cardiovascular pathologist of all time, the number one cause of our number one killer is elevated cholesterol, which means... So this dude's quoting like 1992. Like this science has come a long way since 1992. Um, the fact, so, so why do I really object to Dr. Greger? By the way, let's just see. I think he's the that. cause of our number one killer is not eating enough plants. Yeah, it's complete nonsense. So, so the reason that I really object to Dr. Greger, um, if he was saying, you know, I believe in eating more plants, eat more plants. Uh, it's working for me. <laughs> Looking at him, I'm not sure it's working for him, but fine. He could, he could say something like that. I would have no issues. But what he chooses to do is to cherry pick. He cherry picks experts. I've shown you another uh, example of an expert with equal or greater expertise, Dr. Jerry Reven, um, who was saying something very different. He was saying that the LDL doesn't seem to matter. It doesn't seem to correlate with these things. Insulin resistance is the variable, variable that matters 100% of the time for the diseases that, for, for all of the d lifestyle associated diseases associated with aging, right? For cancers, for heart disease, that's strokes and heart attacks. Uh, even for dementia, right? So a number of diseases that he was able to associate with with insulin resistance. Now, it's hard to prove causation, and I don't really want to get into the causation versus correlation debate here. But what, no matter how you cut it, you, you can find things that disprove the LDL hypothesis. And if you're a reasonable scientist, if you're a scientific-minded person, you are bringing up the things that might disprove what you are saying. And you're examining them, and you're saying maybe why this is why I don't agree with you whatever, Dr. Reven's research or whatever it would be. But what this guy does, he cherry picks only the things that he likes. He puts on the screen only the things that he agrees with. And then he says, look, that proves the point, right? So it's a very dangerous, I mean, this is, this is if you look at some of the biggest fiascos of medical science of the 20th century, this is the mistake that bad scientists make. They only look at the evidence that agrees with their preconceived notion, with their religion, if you want to put it in that way, right? And if we're doing real science, we have to try and disprove the hypotheses that we cling most tightly to. Thanks for listening. I'll see you in the next one.